Jamie Watson, aka Jamie three two six. Welcome to Electronic Music Life. How are you? Hey James, I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm all right. It's a it's a sunny day in Rotterdam, which is kind of rare these days because it's, it's gray here a lot and raining a lot in springtime, but everything's good. Can't complain. Thanks for having me again. Most definitely. And and Rotterdam, Rotterdam's home now, right? You've been there for a while. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I've been living full time in Rotterdam for for five years, but I also used to um, base in Amsterdam when I would tour Europe. So I've based in a few other countries, but Holland, the Netherlands is the best because everyone speaks English here. So yeah. that that really helped. And it's very central yeah. and one of the easiest uh, places to get to the airport, you know, and and good time. So that's most definitely was a, a selling point. And then I have a, you know, a nice, nice support system here. And, you know, it's just been real good to me. And I prefer Rotterdam because it's more urban and it reminds me more home. You know, it's a real modern city feel. Yeah. And no tours. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you, do you visit uh, Chicago often now though? Do you get to frequently go back home? Uh, actually I used to go home like once once a year uh for my mom's birthday but after the whole you know pandemic and lockdown that was the longest that i hadn't been without seeing my family so last year i went home three times and nice i'll be most definitely making it uh a more more regular thing <laughs> that, that's the best way to put it excellent uh it see it seems like it like because from what I understand as well, like there's a, a few people from Chicago that like that. Uh, I mean, I know that Rahan is over there that way as well. He he kind of moved and relocated to the Netherlands as well, I think. Is that right? Do you know? Yeah, there's been a, a, a few people, including him, as well as uh, Sadar. Yes. Uh, so it, it, it's like, so, you know, once again, it's, it's the same thing. We all kind of you know feel that this place is is cool most definitely because it's like the language barrier is is very very important if you're in a stranger in a in a strange land yeah. you know and not being able to know you know the language or speak you know a lot of things out and especially if you you know don't have like you know a good friend or a host with you to help uh what's the word i'm, I'm looking for uh not interrogate <laughs> not interrogate uh interpret <laughs> in, in, interpreter yeah you know it, it it makes a difference uh because i spent time in in paris and when i wasn't there you know with with my friends oh it was hell you know because they don't want to speak you know english at all yeah, yeah you know yeah. and things like that but but most definitely like i said it's like i've uh made a lot of great connections and friendships here and in the Netherlands. And uh, it's just a place that, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm at home and most definitely uh, a lot more at ease. And that used to also be a challenge when I would, you know, be over here for like my spring summer tour and be gone for months and not have to basically feel or be on edge as I was if I was back home in the States. And it's a, a comfortable uh, feeling to, to like feel so at ease, you know, I mean, it's like any place all over the world, you know, things can, you know, happen and things can go down. But being, you know, a black man, especially, you know, a black man from Chicago, it's it was a, a very different feeling to basically be here and be so at ease. And then I basically will have to retrain my spidey senses to go back to the city, <laughs> you know, in, in Chicago, you know, it's like, yeah, I can't walk around with my face all in my phone or just like, la, 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 because I have to be alert, you know, and know, you know, what's going on because it's a totally different Contrast, different yeah. mindset and things like that, you, you know, so sometimes it would, you know, it got to a point that it, it affected me mentally because it's just once you experience a, a different quality of life, it's... And then you go back to basically a shit show, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, yeah. it, it's a mind fuck. And, and as well, it's, um, 
yeah, I feel free. That's the best way. That's the best way to put it. I, I I feel free, so I just decided that this was the best place for me. Just Europe, period, and I was going to make it happen anyway. I could as as well as it was based on personal reasons and business reasons. Yeah, and yeah, it really was one of the best you know best decisions that I've that I've made. So yes, I'm you know here. I'm official. I uh, I pay taxes, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, I'm not just, you know, skirting by and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and doing things like that, You're a you citizen. know, but it really was one <laughs> of the, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm legit. I, yeah. I get those tax, those blue tax letters. Yes. But <laughs> it, it, it's official, but you know, it's also something that I've tried to uh, explain to a lot of people, especially from all of my all of my world travels, it really helped change my perspective on people and, and a lot of things regarding, you know, life. And I've also explained to people that to really see how America is and can be, you have to be outside of America. And then you can see it from a totally different light and perspective. And as well, I've also told people uh, to there's nothing wrong with traveling and, and seeing the world. You'll be very surprised how many places over the world embrace us, especially being, you know, a black American. It's, it's very different. It's a very different experience. And yeah, it really broadened my scope and view of, of people and, and the world. And it's something that I really do embrace. And I know that I'm blessed to be able to have been to a lot of places that are on people's bucket list. And I've been there numerous times and I've soaked in all of this culture and met so many people from so many different walks of life. And the one main connection is music. And it's a beautiful thing. And I would have never thought 30 years ago, this is something I'd be doing. Yeah, you tell me you're going to be living in Europe. Man, get the fuck out of here. You know, I, I would have thought that, especially after, you know, from doing what I do. Yeah, I, I would have never, you know, never thought that. So that's something that always as well. It makes me put a lot of things uh, into a whole different, totally perspective. Yeah. And I, I think um, that's a perfect, uh, uh, like, I wanted to, to sort of touch on, um, you know, the whole, because you, you were based, you were living in Chicago for a long time. You like, it's your hometown. And, um, I like, as I became aware of your work, uh, thankfully through, um, Mad Matt's from local talk, he, uh, he, he, yeah, he introduced me to, uh, you like several years ago. And he was like, uh, you know, someone to watch and look out for. And, and even at that time, I, I was trying to find like opportunities. Um, and I think like at the time there was like a Japanese tour happening and I was trying to connect some dots for you in, in Dubai and, and around the region um, at the time. And it wasn't until several years later that when I was working with the team at Barbary that you came over and and did that show, yeah. and that was the you know yeah. where I you know um, got to see you play as well, and and so where I was getting at is like from um, your early days in the residencies in Chicago, like I've always kind of identified you as being this sort of um, DJ that was kind of like passing the torch from the guys before you, like you were in that sort of generation, so like after after Frankie Knuckles and, and other, other people around that time. I, am I correct by saying that? Like, would that be a correct yeah, assumption? Well, I, I wouldn't say like passing the torch, but well, yeah. what I would say is <laughs> there's, you know, there's, especially like regarding Chicago and Chicago history for so long, it's been almost like this one narrative that's been shared over and over again and the most important generation that took it to another level is like my generation and like some of those right before me so it 
the most crucial period that really made damage worldwide even more was the 90s and it's like they really don't talk about that a, a lot and i feel that sometimes some of these people who have been controlling this narrative won't talk about that period and the real movers and shakers of that period is because they weren't relevant then and as well it was on a whole nother level so i came up as well when i discovered like the milwaukee avenue loft party scene so that would be like i was at some parties where it was like the most incredible lineup where you had Derek carter diz mark farina you know all these guys throwing down at a at a loft party and that was a whole nother generation that that it's like during that time as well then the raves kicked up because a lot of people don't know that the u.s rave scene started in the midwest we're the ones who, who started it and it was a big big scene and it carried over a lot of states and a lot of these main players who were rocking it were all from the midwest especially chicago and detroit and it's like they don't talk about that you know a lot and even with the the very historical part of of the roots of this they still only talk about a few people and it was really a citywide movement and a street dj movement and an underground movement connected it wasn't just one radio station that made it work so you know it basically it really connects with the same kind of way that new york hip-hop history came about from the street djs the block parties the house parties all of that, this break culture, all of that. It was the same thing in Chicago, but the difference was our breaks were disco. It wasn't just soul and funk. And Chicago is a very, you know, we've always been a dance city. So it's as well as like we've had a dance scene happening in Chicago well before Frankie Knuckles got there. There, there was a scene. Ron Hardy was DJing at Den 1 in 1974. So it's like they make this narrative out like Chicago had tumbleweeds <laughs> and things blowing down the street. We, we were just a bunch of country hicks. We didn't know how to party. We didn't know how to get down. And that's not, you know, that's not it. So it, it's like there's so many other, you know, things that could be countered to the same story and narrative that has been spoken so long. But to me, it's like I learned from watching the gods in this i experienced this as a teenager you know i experienced it when before the world got it so i come up in this culture but as well i come up in the culture from the other side of the booth first i was a dancer and a partier before i really started you know playing and you know participating in the culture in that way and even well until when i was still doing you know starting to do my thing I still went out to party because that's how you had to go find out what was the hot new shit, you know? So the nineties period with casual, with, with all of these labels, just kicking ass, you can't deny that. And it's like within probably the past, and this is a shame, but probably within the past 10 years or so now they're talking about the nineties era, you know, which is, really a very critical and important time of Chicago because some of these people who are still out here today uh legends now <clears throat> excuse me legends now and legends of you know producers artists they're still out here now and and they're they're connected to the Chicago sound and it's like this Chicago sound is not just about this one period from 1984 to 1987 it, it went in a whole nother direction because technology also changed. And as well, because my generation and like the one before me, we kind of flipped it and did our own thing. I still feel that, you know, sometimes the same narrative is pushed because some people are left out of the mix, you know, and it's sad, but that's one thing that I've also been down to champion is to share you know the culture and the history from my perspective because it's also coming from a perspective from someone who was in it and 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 knee deep in it 
you know, so it's like I can share my personal experiences with this because I was in it. I wasn't in it because it was trendy or whatever. I was in this culture because this is what spoke out to me. So as well, I take it upon myself now to help share my experiences and as well be a positive representative of the city that where I'm from. I'm not from Chirac. I'm from Chicago. I'm not going to ever co-sign that Chirac shit because a lot of people don't know that that's glamorizing madness and bullshit. And I've had to check so many people even over here on this side to hear from Chicago and instantly because they're all into, you know, like the whole, you know, the whole drill rap scene and all that sound. And, you know, like, oh, you from Chirac? And I'm like, no, I'm from Chicago. And, you know, then when I explain to them, you know, that this stuff that you're, you know, that you, you think is cool on these records, what's really going on from this, you know, and then they're like, oh, I didn't see that or, or know that, you know, yeah, you can, it might seem cool to you, you know, because you're in a safe, comfortable place, but it's not cool to the people that are in these environments and have to deal with the fallout from these rap beefs and things that 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 end up going to the streets and you know innocent people and children sometimes end up being the casualties from this yeah you know so it, it's also one of the other things that one of my personal missions has been for now well over 20 years has been to change the the narrative and the view of ron hardy because Ron Hardy is someone who you can't mention house music and not mention Ron Hardy because technically Ron Hardy really is the, in my opinion, the true godfather of house because Ron Hardy is the DJ who broke the acid sound. Ron Hardy is the DJ who broke a lot of, of things because he was also accessible. So he would play these young producers tracks and things like that. A lot of other people weren't. And then as well, they jumped on the bandwagon later. But there was one time you could not deny this brother's power and impact, especially on this culture. And for some people to get in the press and then the first thing they mention is, you know, he had, you know, had a habit and they talk about that. But it's like so many people have talked about that to the point that those same quotes that were made over 20, 25 years ago are being used. So that's the image that's being projected, you know, out there uh, of this guy. And then the other thing is, I know some of his family. So there's things that, you know, like Ron's mother, bless her soul, she couldn't see some of this stuff because it reminds, you know, a parent doesn't want to, you know, see something bad or negative, you know, about, about the child. So, you know, because it's just, excuse me, just rehashing trauma. And so that's why I also make it, uh, I make sure that I am telling a proper narrative of the history, my experiences and things like that, because this stuff, once it's down, it's out. So you have to make sure that you're saying, you know, the, the, the right thing, because as well, people can misquote things. People are, will only focus in on certain things just for a reason. And yeah, so it's very good now to see that a lot of things regarding Ron Hardy are changing and he's getting his just due. You know, I was part of the benefit with the Hardy family and Terry Hunter. And so many of us from Chicago to put on this benefit to get him a headstone, you know, that happened. That was like one of my personal <laughs> missions to to, you know, I always wanted to do and, and help make happen. So I was very honored to be a, you know, a part of that to see him get, you know, his just doing and, and things like that. And he influenced so many people and generations of people. So if it wasn't for the Internet. This brother would just be an enigma. So I'm kind of glad that, yeah. you know, he's getting his shine. Well, thank you. And, and, thank and you so well much uh, the, for sharing all this. This is like like um, giving me another perspective. Like even me, uh, uh, um, you know, being 
a, a lover of house music and and disco for for many years, and uh, I, I feel very uh, privileged. And uh, thank you for that, man. That was that was uh, awesome. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, because I, you know, sorry, I'm sorry because <laughs> no, I was no. going to say, you know, the thing, the thing about Ron Hardy. The other thing about Ron Hardy was I followed him until he couldn't, you know, till he couldn't play anymore. So I actually saw him like going down, you know, in regards to his popularity and from him pulling in hundreds of thousands of people to me being at some places and it wasn't that many people, you know, but I followed him, you know, till I couldn't follow him anymore because it's like, I was a hardcore fan. So once again, I understand that from a party person's perspective in regards to their favorite DJs or, or things like that. Once again, I understand it because I come from it. So, you yeah. know, that's one thing that as well, it, it's like, you know, you have a lot of people who tell a story about them and they're like, yeah, it's just like the glory days, but it's like, you don't talk about, this other period or when he was pushing nothing but new songs and, and new current music. So it's like, especially in like from 90 to 91, he really was playing and breaking a lot of now that's classic house music, you know, regarding like some sounds from New York and things like that. So, yeah. So it's like, I can talk about that and some people can't because once again, I was there, you know, and, some people liked it. It was a, yeah, like I said, it was like a shift. So I was younger. So he still was, was the bomb to me versus older people who were like, okay, yeah, we're over this kitty kind of stuff. And now we're in clubs or we're, you know, doing this and doing that. So yeah, he most definitely uh, was a huge influence on me and a, a, a few others who also don't get there just right, as well as like Lil Lewis. He's someone who, really should be getting a lot more love and attention uh, as being a godfather of this, especially in Chicago, because he took things to another level. He was one of like the first DJs of many, but he took it to a whole nother level where he was the DJ, the promoter, the artist. Prior to that, promoters brought in DJs and put on events. He was the one that did everything, <laughs> you know, himself and brought thousands of people together and had people in, you know, us teenagers in these ballrooms and hotels downtown, you know, but his parties and events were just on a whole nother level. And once again, it influenced a whole nother generation, uh, two generations, actually. So, yeah, most definitely. It, it seemed, it seems like over, well. over time, um, like and I, and I see this as a pattern in in other um, like it, other histories of music or and it seems like there's a pattern where eventually there you know there's some attention or focus towards some of these pivotal characters in history and they eventually like someone will create a documentary and and add more focus on these people and let's hope that that happens with these these figures that you're uh discuss you know these people i've known of their names and like i i grew up in sydney australia and uh i for me house music and dance music culture was came to me early 90s um and it, it was that australia had its own rave scene and rave culture and dance scene right. from from the 80s um and so that that like people like these figures, it, it it goes to show how powerful their impression was and how it trickled around the world and came to Sydney, you know, came yeah. to Australia as well at the yeah. same time. I'm, I yeah. and I meant I, you also um you mentioned that racial divide and uh, whitewashing is something that you want to kind of unpack and bring more awareness towards. And the reason I'm bringing that up now as well is the narrative around this, would you say, has it um, changed and improved in ways? And it's still obviously a huge issue to, to tackle, but have you seen it become, two, there's two questions here. Have you seen it become 
like a um you know has it evolved in a way for for as improvement and better and has that because i see cuz you're talking about narratives here would you say that that narrative as well has impacted dance music culture black music as well like and and has that caused an impact on on uh, these pivotal figures i think that's where i was getting at uh, you know is is very this is very interesting because i've i've mentioned this to people and it's just very interesting like i say about the narrative and how things are and i can give you a perfect example it's like house music techno music is is black music even if you say that and you say it online you know you have people say and, and they use these lines and it's just like I'm going to go down the script. <laughs> so it's like, first they say music has no color. Or they say, why do you have to bring race into it? Or the most annoying one is, what about craft work? You know, <laughs> you know, it is. I love that it, one. <laughs> they always bring up craft work. They're going to say craft work. And then, then the next one is because is they get go across the board and then they say, Oh, but the, this music wouldn't happen if it wasn't for for the Japanese people at Roland. You know, you know this <laughs> this kind of stuff, and, and it's it's like, oh my god, you know. So it's it's like it's very interesting because as well, you can even though this music comes from from the Midwest and from Black people, it got regurgitated and flipped to a way even at one time in the nineties in the in the states. To where you would mention techno music to black people, and they'd be like, "Oh, that's that, that's white music, you know, or, 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 or that's that white kid shit, or blah blah blah." And over here, you also have people who think techno music originated here in Europe, and then they're freaked out when they figure out, "Oh, it comes from Detroit," you know, because with all these magazines and everything's like that, the images that they see. Are just this same, you know, image of these people, and they've also taken it and then flipped it in a whole nother way and repackaged it, you know, in, in a different way. But the other difference is, I also see that regarding techno, there are people here in Europe who do know the roots and they embrace the hell out of Detroit, and, but as well, sometimes. They they almost glamorize it, you know, to 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 a certain extent, you know. Oh, Detroit, Detroit, Detroit. You see people with the Detroit hats and things like that. But then as well, it's like they really don't know what's really going on in Detroit, or it, it's almost like it's the the sexy thing or the trendy thing to do. Oh, yeah, I love techno, so yeah, and I love Detroit techno, so I have to get me a Detroit hat, you know, or something like this. But I, I'm not you know knocking it to to you know to a certain extent but then as well especially over the past two years with climate and the way a lot of things have happened you know especially with us speaking out about you know george floyd all of this and it brought so many more conversations into it and then dance music came into it and then a prime example would be jeff mills speaks out he's using this platform He's trying to teach and inform, tell his people, you know, the roots of where this music comes from. He's looked at to some of these kids as a techno god. Even some of these same people were telling him basically, shut up and play the music. You know, when he's trying to tell them and explain to them where this music comes from and open up, you know, basically like a conversation, a narrative. And people are telling him to shut up and play music, just like they told LeBron James, shut up and dribble. You you know, so it's just like it's amazing to 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 see that. So it also, you know, you had these whole campaigns going on where they're like, oh, we're gonna diversify, oh, we're gonna have a black square day and and all of this, and we're going to, you know, we're gonna diversify, we understand. You know this and that we they even all like had the same pr script 
And they're like, we understand the roots of this music and where it comes from, blah, blah, blah. We stand in solidarity, all of that. Yeah. Months later, those same, some of those same companies, some of those same, you know, production companies, events, all of that, put out a lineup. No black artists, no female artists, no, <laughs> no artists of color, no, no nothing. It's like they went right back to business as usual. And it's like they had to, you know, put this out there to try to calm people or make it seem like they're down for the cause. And they're really not. Yeah, there's some events that are diversifying, so, so to speak. But still, the numbers and the percentage, you know, very low. And sometimes, yeah, as a as a black artist, sometimes it's, it's a kick in, the, kick in the face, you know, or a slap in the face. Because it's just like, especially when you know the roots and where it comes from. And then you, you see people profiting so much off of it. And as well, to the point that, you know, yeah, it's cool. Let's add a few cool black DJs and... You know, we put them on the lineup, but then as well, you have them off to the side playing by the toilets <laughs> at a festival. You you got them in a shitty area or something like that. And then, then you have some fly by night, you know, come in and they're getting five to almost 10, 20 times what what you're getting. And you come from the place where this from, where this originates from. So, yeah, it, it's it's pretty tripped out sometimes. And some people don't don't understand you know what you know artists artists go through especially from where where we're from so it, it's like i don't pay attention too much to lip service so even when they were doing the whole black square thing or whatever i was just like i'm going to keep my eyes open and just see you know and i'm like let me see if i'll get proven wrong and it's like i really wasn't so yeah. in this industry there's not a lot of um uh, it's not a lot of black promoters black brown whoever there's not a lot of people on the production side the promotion side the marketing side and it, it's it's a boys club you know it, it, it it's a boys club to a, most definitely you know a, a white boys club you know it, it's just i'm just speaking facts you sure. know it, it is sure. what it is yeah. but yeah you know and sometimes as an artist, you know, you also are sometimes put in a box to where you you have to be cautious of what you may speak out on because sometimes it could be backlash, even if it's true or, 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 or whatever, you know, but I'm at a point where I'm like, I'm not going to walk on eggshells and I'm like, hey, if it makes you uncomfortable, maybe that's a good thing because maybe you need to face or see it from a different perspective or, or, or put yourself in someone else's shoes, you know, to, to understand this. So it's, yeah, but it, it's like, just like when the tensions were just so high, you know, two years ago and to see just some of these reactions and responses from when black artists, especially black artists who were very known and they used their platform to, to speak out on certain things and to speak on, on certain things or yeah. even to share, you know, our pain. Some people don't even understand that this kind of stuff is painful to us. So, so they, they don't even understand that because they have a lot of privilege. And it's like, even if we do come together, we speak out about certain things. People are also so, so in tune to be able to tune it out. Or be like, oh, they're just bitching and moaning or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, the only way we're going to get real change is if people from the other side call their own people out. That's that's the only way it, what it's, it's going to happen. What, and that's just, sorry, go on. period. Well, I was just going to say, what I are you- And that's just, just period. Yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts now? Like, because what I've seen as a quite a- um, a trend thing that still occur, like it's happening as we speak. And while like, you know, there's some positive to it, I guess, but you know, there's a lot of companies and like music organizations 
that or an, or big festivals and events that want to look culturally diverse and and look like they're doing they're being responsible and exactly. um, and so like it's great because black artists indigenous artists they're they're getting um work and they're getting recognized and yeah get that get paid like get money you know right yeah so it's great but right. there's this it, it also this irks me personally like it irks me when i see that being used in a in a kind of in a way to 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 look like they're being responsible you know what i mean like that yeah and yeah. i see that still happening there i wanted i'd like what are your thoughts on that it, you know it, it's very interesting because i'm i love history and i follow a lot of things and i can make a lot of connections it's very interesting because the same thing happened like coming out of the civil rights movement into the 70s. It's like the same thing. It was like black became cool, the cool hip thing. <laughs> and it's like, you know, on top of, you know, oh, let's, we got to include these people, you know, that, that kind of thing as well. But we've also, we've, always made shit cool the thing is we make shit cool but we don't make money from it <laughs> that's the that that's that's the biggest difference you know but it's like once again it's, it's just like almost it's almost like it's a, a cycle you know happening again but just like you say yeah i'm glad to see some people you know yeah take advantage of it you know don't be foolish you know get your money get your shine you know the best way you can but sometimes i'm like it shouldn't take guilt for you to include people you should just want to do it because they dope yes you know yes, it, yes. It, it you know you should just want to do it because they fucking talented not just because oh we got to fill a quota we need to get four female right. djs yes. <laughs> you know yeah three black ones one brown yeah yeah, yeah you yeah. know and 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 someone else you, you know it, it, it's like they want to make it seem all-inclusive but in reality, still, when you look at the numbers, it's still a small percentage. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to see if this change continues after the sexiness wears off. <laughs> you, you, you know, and, yeah. and that's with, you know, that, and that's with, you know, including, you know, ladies who throw down, you know, I, I really hate even using the term people of color. But, you know, it, it's just everyone. It's a it's a it's a space for everyone. But as well, sometimes you have to create your own space. And that's something that I'm also seeing being done with some younger generations, you know, like uh, the Black Artist Database and, and, you know, these events that are going on, like in like Portugal and things like that. So I'm seeing what's happening with a lot of the younger creatives, even on this side. And I'm like, cool. And I fully support it. Like, Hey, do what you do, create your own space, do your thing, celebrate and, and, and do it, you know, and I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Like, I, I think, I think it is definitely uh, a time for, um, to, to, uh, take advantage and, and, and see where, it, where it goes and where it leads for sure. I, I also wanted to chat with you about your your journey. I think this is what like really sort of captured me to um, is is about your your health and lifestyle and the mental health journey that you've been on significantly over the last ten years, I'd say. And I um, I wanted to like uh, you know uh, I, I, and touch on your story back at, like you know that pivotal moment in Japan in that hotel room. And and if, if if you'd like to share about that and and where and what where it's taken you and what um and what you want to be doing now in uh, bringing awareness to this in in the dance music space. You know, it's uh, there's one thing that you know I've 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 had no problem. It took a long time to get to a point where. I was even comfortable or open enough to share 
some of my experiences, even just with personal people, but to actually get to a point that I'm sharing this on my platform uh, because it's, you know, I have people that I've, I've lost to, to suicide, you know, to, to drugs, to things like that. And in this business, that's par for the course. It's you're in a party culture. This is <laughs> after parties are where most business dealings go down and, 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 and things like that. And, you know, it's also if you're put into a position, you know, like the perfect example would be like Avicii, you know, and because the thing is, a lot of people don't understand. They think this is very glorious you know, or glamorous rather, that you're, you're jet setting, you're here, you're there, you and it's a very lonely journey to begin with, number one. Number two, what a lot of people don't understand is if you're doing two to three gigs, some some artists are doing two to three gigs in a night and hop hopping planes and time zones and all of that, this and the lack of rest, it already has wrecks havoc on your mind body and soul then it's inhumanly possible to do all of this and then that's where you bring in drugs and things like that to go and sometimes it's not just hard drugs you know sometimes it's you know pills or whatever you know to keep you up keep you going or whatever and from my own personal experience i learned that I guess it's the old saying of getting what you wish for. And I had one of the craziest uh, years of, of touring and I wasn't ready for it more than I thought. Then from also having, you know, dealing with depression, being bipolar, things like that. Some of this stuff already falls I fall victim to that just naturally from, from what I'm, I'm dealing with. So I self-medicated and then from self-medicating, then already having <laughs> everything I wanted handed to me on a platter. That was just, you know, a recipe, you know, a recipe for, for disaster. And it, it's like with me sharing some of my experiences because there's a lot of especially artists it's a lot of people you, you have to portray this image you know you, you have to be a certain way or even your team would tell you you know what you should be posting on social media what you should do or is this is everyone's just celebrating or putting out the highs you know so as well it's like everyone's wearing a mask you know and i wore a mask as well but it's like it gets to a point where it's like yeah you can have you can see some people that look like they're on the top of the world but are they happy you know some of these people you know i've shared my my story online and i i'm not gonna you know name anyone but there's people who hit me up and they was just like thank you I've been going through this or I've been dealing with this and no one would know that, you know, no, no one would know because as well, even in, in my own community, you know, and just period, there's still a stigma attached to, to mental health issues. You know, I'm, I'm very glad to see within as well the past few years, there's been a focus on, you know, making it okay to protect your mental health or understand you have some mental health issues and it's okay to speak about it or, you know, use mindfulness. Yes. Think things like that. But there's definitely been like, a shift. It, there's definitely been a shift in yes. acceptance of, of this uh, yes. discussion and this conversation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But you, most definitely cause I can remember time it, it, it wasn't, I can remember, you know, when you say, hey, I, I'm going to see a therapist, we're like, man, he's crazy. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, it's, 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 now it's, it's good for therapy to, 
be normalized or start to be normalized, you know, and being able to talk about your your mental health. Uh, but like I said, in, in this industry, it's like drugs and alcohol. It goes hand in hand with with this because it's part of the party culture or whatever. But I had to I had to learn to face a lot of uh, things that I was you know, running from, hiding from. And that's one of the hardest things for people to do is to, number one, own up to your own shit, <laughs> your yeah. own part, yeah. you know, and, and, and things. And as well, be alone and be able to face the person in the mirror and know that, hey, I'm not right. Something's not right. And I need to work on this and, and want to be a, a, a better person. And, you know, we're all human. No one's perfect. But as well, it's like some people, including myself, I numbed myself because I didn't want to deal with feelings. You know, I numbed myself because of past traumas. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the main things that, you know, even when they're talking the, you know, with the mental health narrative, you know, they also say, especially of recent, they've been saying now that, you know, it's about unhealed traumas. Yeah. And it's like the root cause of a lot of things. Yeah. But honestly, it's deeper than that. It's childhood trauma. Yeah. That really is yeah. the the root cause of, of a lot Absolutely. Of, of issues. I and, agree with you 100, 100%. You know, and also what helped me was, uh, was hypnotherapy. And that's something that yeah, I'm tell me a advocate, bit about that. What kind of what, you know, what, for. tell me a bit about the, the 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 type of hypnotherapy that was or you and, and that you're still doing. Uh, like what is the the technique? Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 even crazy with <laughs> with even discussing this, uh, because I'm I'm laughing at myself because it's going back to the same thing, you know, I, I said about, you know, people going to see a therapist and like, hey man, he's crazy. You know, it was the same thing about me with being hypnotized, you know, or I'm thinking, you know, ain't nobody gonna hypnotize me and then he get all my money and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I'm not doing that, you know, but it's like that story isn't even crazy because it's like I kind of hit rock bottom at a tour in Japan and I was in 2019 and it was rough and I also was not the best with performing. I was going through a lot and I just was in this small hotel room dark you know, drinking and then I was just like I can't do this no more and I knew about this guy because uh, he's famous and my uh, my girlfriend gave me this book from him his name's Alan Carr He's like famous for the whole stop smoking. Yep, yep, yep. You know, yep. a smoking book or whatever. Well, he also has like a in-house program where you could go in and they have like a full list of all kinds of stuff that you could go in for these programs. And then it's like at the end of the program, it's like 30 minutes, you know, a hypnotherapy. So when I... uh before I left that tour, I made a uh, made an appointment to go to one of the Allen Carr centers in London, uh, and I had a gig there. I came back from you know Japan, then I went to London, and I did this uh, you know this treatment. I'm calling it a treatment, but it's really not like a treatment. It's like a class. You went through so much, uh, but at the end of this whole thing and it was only for alcohol but at the end of it you know it was like 30 minutes of hypnotherapy and i'm in there and i'm like this is not working i'm like i'm not under i'm hearing people in there snoring <laughs> you know i'm like i'm not under this ain't working whatever and then it's like i kind of felt myself you know like going under or whatever then the guy was like boom wake up 
and I was pissed. <laughs> so I'm like, I paid all of this, and I'm like, this was the part I was looking for, especially because I challenged myself to even get over going to get hypnotized and all of this stuff. And I was just like, man, this is shit. And I went out that night and I didn't have one drink. And I was in a bar, you know, in a party. Didn't have a drink. Ultimate test. The next night, a gig. Prior to that, my rider was I need the biggest bottle of Jameson you can give me. That was on my rider. You know, it's like, I need that. And I'm in this party. Everything is there. I didn't do anything. And I haven't touched drugs or alcohol. It'll be three years, June 14th. Wow. The crazy thing was this program that I went to and then this hypnotherapy you know, part of it, it was just for alcohol, but it stopped me from everything else. And it was also very, uh, it's a very intense period after that for some months because number one, I had to deal and process feelings and emotions yeah. that I had been numbing myself from. So some things were so intense. And then as well, having to be in, you know, situations with events or certain people that I had, you know, made a connection with via partying and things like that. And then wondering, is this going to affect me, you know, with my business? Because now I'm a square and I interacted with these people on a certain level. Are they going to think, you know, now I'm going to, you know, snitch or talk shit about them or, or how they get down or whatever? Is it going to affect, yeah. you know, my career? My job? So, you know, it, it was all of this that I had to process. And, and, and then it's like. After that, I went through a breakup and then I went and I really got into uh, found a great hypnotherapist that I was rec referred to from a friend in Amsterdam and he really helped me even more wow. on my healing journey and for me to as well stop beating myself up about certain things and it really changed my life and it made me get healthy made me appreciate living made me appreciate life <laughs> You know, and to uh, as well, I, I broke a cycle that I had uh, never done before. I was completely alone, not with, you know, not hopping from relationship to relationship, situationship to situationship, whatever. I was, for the first time in my life, totally alone. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I, I totally abstained from everything and, and, and you found and you were okay me. with that you were okay with that like that's yeah, what, yeah. And, and i found and i found myself even more with you know as well continuing with these you know hypnotherapy sessions and then i discovered uh rtt which is rapid uh transitional therapy and that's like that's like therapy and hypnotherapy on steroids. And it's helped me even, you know, even more. And it's something that I, you know, I really, you know, in, implore people to, to try, you know, if not just that, some kind of therapy period. Yeah. You know, and to be able to, to talk and, and, and deal with things. But yeah, it's it's been life changing. And I just... I love life. I love living. And on top of everything, I love myself. And that's something that I didn't do. I thought I did. Yeah. But I yeah. didn't. If I really loved myself, yeah. I wouldn't have been damn near killing myself. You know, all of this. You know, I mean, I even had a reputation for being a, a wild party animal because I was just out of fucking control yeah. <laughs> you know now that i look back and then as well it's like 
what also started that cycle was also I had guilt and shame because I also would would be guilty and, and feel shame when I would think about or things would get back to me about how I behaved. And I'm supposed to be a professional. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm supposed to, you know, carry myself a certain way. And it's just very, very interesting because I was warned about some of these pitfalls and what to look out for and situations. Some years back, wild things were starting to kick up. And then I'm like, yeah, I got this. I know. And everything that I was told, I lived through. I experienced it. And I'm like, I get it. And some people can never have that moment of clarity or, or understanding. And I mean, still, I'm human. I'm not, you know, completely perfect. But now I know I have different coping mechanisms now versus, you know, drugs, alcohol, different strategies. Sex. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's it, the thing is, as well, it's like I do my best to not judge people, especially, you know, with with people in this industry or, or whatever. But I also do my best to tell people that's why I feel like I need to share my story or some of my experiences so it can help people. And then I can do the same thing that that person forewarned me about, you know, but it's well to share these experiences so people can understand that, you know, you're not alone, but there are some pitfalls to this and you have to be careful because the beast could chew you up and spit you out, you know, and then they on to the next thing, you know, so you, you have to also Take into consideration how important rest is. Uh, because especially with this traveling and all that as an artist, it has an effect on you more than you know the lack of sleep. And it really affects your mental health more than you know. And then when you add in chemicals and everything else, oh, it's gone when the crash comes is 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 going to come and it can either be mentally or physically or if not both you know so it's it's very it's a very risky you know risky business to 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 be in if you know the self care the self care is not personality. there yeah 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 because self care is very very important and you have to learn that and some people learn it a hard way and some people already know it, but that's why I don't have a problem sharing, you know, my experiences or, you know, being transparent because for so long I wore a mask or I wasn't transparent and it's like, I just want to help people, you yeah. know, and, and I understand it, you know, from a different perspective. And, and because I've been been made aware of <laughs> of this, and it's from personal experience, it's just something that I I, I want to do to to help people. So it's like one thing that I'm I'm planning to uh, to do is to uh, become a coach, and I want to create something that will help artists. Yeah. Uh, and because as well, the difference is sometimes if you, you know, you can speak to a therapist, coach or whatever. Sometimes they kind of going off a script or textbook or, or they have a textbook response to certain things or a, a textbook fix or whatever. And I guess I can understand it from a different perspective because I lived it and yeah. I've been in it. So I can understand some things that. Some professionals may not be able to understand, especially when you're dealing with, you know, artists and creatives. We already our minds and brains operate very differently, you know, to to begin with. And, you know, sometimes people because I know I would do it at a time as well. You know, you think, oh, I got to take something to get creative or to feel this way or, or, or get like that. And you don't. 
you you know you 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 really don't as well as I thought I would be different because I'm not the wild crazy guy you know drunk wild crazy guy and guess what I'm still that crazy guy I'm just not drunk and fucked up <laughs> <laughs> and I, that, I, that, that, that's the difference yeah yeah I I really appreciate um this and it, it is a big part of why I've got this podcast um because it's these kind of conversations that bring more awareness to this subject matter you know this um and and there are so many different modalities out there that people are using to get them into that healing journey and everyone's got different stories and and again like one of the, the one of the things that um that I, I i also in my own work too now is is to i feel like i feel like this kind of conversation or being having um a healthy lifestyle in the music business and particularly dance music as well is like i want to remove yes. that um I, it seems there is a sh- a big shift in people becoming more and more uh comfortable about living healthy lifestyles in music yes. whereas it it seems like yes. that wasn't accepted before you know and so um yes mate i i, I really loved our conversation today um it's uh, pretty much time now I just wanted to say thank you oh. so much for for coming on today, sharing about Chicago history. It's been just absolutely amazing, um, Jamie. It's great to get to know you a bit better as well, outside of a club environment. <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I know that um, I, I saw that you've got a you've got a bunch of gigs coming up, but that's great uh, to see that things are moving along for for performances. I saw on Resident Advisor today that uh, there's a bunch of gigs coming up. You want to tell the listeners where is the best way to find out about you, where, uh, and what's happening in in Jamie three two six's world. Okay, well, <laughs> you know the easy, <laughs> the easy thing to do is, you know, I'm Googleable. That's my word. I'm, I'm Googleable. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, for on on the socials, you can always catch me. Uh, most definitely, like I said, the. You know, the resident advisor, I'm always up there. But as well, you can catch me out on Instagram, Jamie326, J-A-M-I-E, 3-T-O-O-6. I'm still on the Facebooks, you know, and I I share a lot of stuff. But as well, you know, in in case you like you want mixes or music or whatever, I'm on Spotify. I'm on all platforms. I also do a monthly radio show for uh, Defected, Defected Records, Defected Broadcasting House. Awesome. So that's also... um, on youtube and twitch so yeah i I, i'm out there i'm some everywhere and then i also have a a a lot of stuff coming out i also have uh an ep ep with my partner danu p from here in rotterdam our new ep will be dropping on shake records dan shakes label uh i believe it's going live in the next few days digital and then the vinyl will be out in july Amazing. So yeah, there's a there's a lot going on. So just stay tuned and keep your ears and eyes open because I'm not done. I'm just getting started. Amazing. All right, you have a great summer ahead. Your the the season's just kicking off. So uh, enjoy your enjoy your yeah. summer. Um, I'm sure people are gonna be uh, loving your DJ sets as usual. Um, thanks again yeah, for coming that's on the to plan. yeah. Thanks for coming on to Electronic Music Life again. Yeah. Man, thanks a lot, James, man. I, I appreciate it. And once again, you know, hopefully from this conversation, you know, some people can see it, uh, you know, that there is a way, you know, and you, you can't be all right, you know, and it's fuck the stigmas, yeah. you know, just get get help because hurt people hurt people. Stop the pain. Yeah. You got to stop that cycle. Right on, man. Thank you, Jamie.